Ever come across those videos entitled Demon Code or Mystical Algorithm, and it turns out that the code in question is just making use of some bitwise operations? Well, I'm here to tell you that these operations are in fact not magical, but they are exceedingly useful. In comparison to modern computers, the NES and other 6502-based systems have some pretty intense constraints. All you have to do is compare the 2 kilobytes of RAM on the NES to the 16 gigabytes of RAM on my extremely outdated gaming PC to see what I mean. With this being the case, it behooves us as 6502 programmers to squeeze every last bit of information we can out of such a limited memory space. And I mean that literally. Instead of always thinking in terms of bytes when handling data, you'll sometimes want to break those bytes down and manage their individual bits. In order to facilitate such data-efficient programming, the 6502 comes loaded with a slew of instructions known as bitwise operations. These instructions allow you to manipulate the individual bits of a given byte, and in this episode, I'm going to show you some ways that they can be used. But before we go flipping bits, I need you to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. You might as well hit the bell icon while you're at it so as to be efficiently informed when I post more 6502 programming content. Okay, with the shameless self-promotion out of the way, let's turn our attention to an important concept in low-level programming. How to view data. Consider a single byte of data, such as C9. At a fundamental level, this byte is just a particular arrangement of ones and zeros in the system RAM on the NES or the program ROM on a cartridge. Effectively, it's just unstructured information. However, we can choose to interpret this data in a multitude of ways. For instance, we may view it as a single unsigned 8-bit number. Viewed this way, the byte has a decimal value of 201. Along the same lines, we can also view the byte as being four 2-bit numbers side by side. That is to say, the first four bits of the number represent a C or 12, and the last four bits represent a 9. If we have two values that only require four bits each, this is a pretty cool way to make use of a single byte to get two numbers for the price of one. Next, consider the byte from the perspective of 6502 machine code. It turns out that C9 is the opcode that represents a CMP instruction using an immediate addressing mode. If the processor encounters a C9 as the first byte of an instruction during execution, it will perform a comparison between the accumulator's value and the numeric value in the next byte of the ROM. Yet another common way we can view the byte is by assigning a meaning to each of the individual bits. This is called a bit mask, with each bit representing the answer to a single yes or no question. I could keep going with more examples, but I think you get the point. A byte isn't just a number. It's 8 bits over which we can apply any type of structure that we need to solve a particular problem. This is a key concept in low-level programming, especially on 8-bit systems like the NES. But more importantly for this video, to get the most out of bitwise operations, you'll need to start viewing bytes in this more abstract way. Let's get a little practice with this by diving in and defining the logic operations supported by the 6502. Logic, at least in computer science, generally deals with statements and conditions that are either true or false, otherwise known as Boolean values. We cover this to some degree in the branching episode, as branch instructions do one of two things depending on a given condition being set or not set, such as the carry flag containing a 1 or a 0. Speaking of ones and zeros, since a single bit can only contain these two values, it's perfectly sized to denote a single Boolean value. And generally, we use a bit value of 1 to denote true, and a bit value of 0 to denote false. So again, one way to view a byte is as a piece of data containing the Boolean values for eight true or false statements. The logical operations provided by the 6502 perform actions on these Boolean values, producing another Boolean value as a result. This works in a similar way to the mathematical operations that you're probably more familiar with, such as addition and multiplication. For example, the addition operation takes two numbers and produces a third number that's equal to their sum. But instead of only working with two individual Boolean values at a time, the 6502 instructions work along all of the bits in two bytes simultaneously to produce another 8-bit number. This is where they earn their moniker, Bitwise. The first logical operation is called AND, which takes two Boolean values and produces a third according to a specific set of rules. Since there are only two possible values for each Boolean input, this means that there are only four possible sets of parameters that the operation can accept. True, 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 false, false, true, and false, false. 
Symbolically, we usually denote the AND operation using kind of an upside down V, or encode via an ampersand. Stepping through the four possibilities, we see that true and true results in a value of true. True and false is false, false and true is false, and finally, false and false is also false. A simpler way of stating this is that the result is true if and only if both inputs are true. Otherwise, the result is false. This kind of makes sense because the result is only true if both the first input and the second input are true. By swapping true with 1 and false with 0, we can take a look at how this operation works if the inputs are bits. Basically, 1 and 1 will result in a 1, and any other combination of bits will result in a 0. Expanding this notion to a full 8-bit byte, we finally come to our first bitwise logic operation, AND, aka bitwise AND with accumulator. This instruction performs the logical AND operation across each of the bits in the accumulator register and each of the bits in the given memory location, then stores the result back into the accumulator. For instance, suppose that the accumulator holds a value of F2 and the processor executes a bitwise AND against a given immediate value of AF. By expanding the hexadecimal values into binary, we can take a look at how the processor handles the instruction. Upon execution, the 6502 performs a logical AND operation across all eight pairs of bits in each byte simultaneously. This produces eight new bits that each represent the result of a single AND operation. Upon completion, the 6502 then copies these results back into the accumulator. In this case, the binary value 10100010, or A2 in hexadecimal. This is the basic computational structure for all bitwise logic operations on the 6502. The only difference between them is which logical operation is being carried out. So let's drive it home by looking at the other two. The next operation is called OR, and it works in a similar way to that of AND, but has its own special set of rules. Symbolically, the operation is generally denoted using a large V symbol or a vertical bar when written in code. Like AND, the OR operation takes two Boolean valued parameters and produces a Boolean value result. Looking at the four possible input combinations, we see that the result of the OR operation will be true if either of the parameters are true or if both of them are true. This last bit of the definition can sometimes be a sticking point for those who are new to logic. This is because in everyday English, we use OR to mean one or the other, but not both. Whereas logical OR means one, the other, or both. The type of operation we use in English actually has a representation in logic, and is called exclusive OR. The operation, which is usually denoted by a plus inside of a circle or a caret in code, operates more like our intuitive notion of OR. Once again, looking at the four possible sets of parameters, we see that the exclusive OR operation results in a value of true when one of the inputs is true and the other is false. Both operations are represented on the 6502 via a couple more instructions, ORA and EOR. ORA, or bitwise OR with accumulator, performs the OR operation across two bytes, and EOR, or bitwise exclusive OR, does the same for the exclusive OR operation. The instructions both work in a similar fashion to that of the AND operation that I detailed earlier. So instead of breaking them down further, let's dive into some code and see how they work on a practical level. Imagine you're writing a Metroidvania-style game where the player can collect a set of power-ups such as double jump, ball form, etc. In order to correctly process the game logic, you'll need to store whether or not the player has unlocked each of the enhancements. One way to do this would be to use a single byte in RAM for each one, setting a value of 0 if the player has yet to obtain the power-up, and a value of 1 if they have. But since each value only requires a single bit of information, you'll be wasting 7 precious bits per power-up. With 8 power-ups, this is 56 bits, or 7 whole bytes of wasted RAM. A better way of handling the situation is to use a single byte in RAM as a bit mask, where we assign the acquisition state for each power-up to an individual bit. For instance, we could assign ball form to bit 0, double jump to bit 2, and power armor to bit 6, or whatever we want to any position that makes the most sense. With this sort of structure imposed on the data, we can then leverage the 6502's bitwise operations to test and change the data as needed in the game logic. Often, we'll need to check whether or not the player has obtained a given power-up in order to correctly handle the game's logic. A good example of this is when processing a double jump. After the player has jumped once, we need to know if we can execute a second jump based on the enhancements that the player has collected. 
Assuming that our bit mask is stored at RAM address 40, one way to perform the check is with the following code. We begin by loading an immediate bit mask value into the accumulator that isolates the bit at position 2, where we store whether or not the player has obtained the double jump ability. The next instruction performs a bitwise logical AND with the mask in the accumulator and the power up mask in RAM. Moving through the AND operation bit by bit, we see that each zero bit in the isolation mask always produces a zero result, since zero and anything is always zero by definition. The only thing that can vary here is the result of the AND operation across the bits at position 2. If the player does have double jump, then the mask in RAM will have a 1 for that position and the operation will result in a 1. If the player doesn't have double jump, then the bit value will be 0, yielding a value of 0. Putting this all together, we see that after the instruction has executed, the accumulator will contain a value of 0 if the player doesn't have double jump, and it will contain a non-zero value if they do, specifically the numeric value 4. This is where the next instruction comes into play. BEQ, or branch if equal, is an instruction that will perform a branch if the zero flag is set. As it turns out, when the AND operation is performed, it will set the zero flag if the result placed into the accumulator is a zero. Again, this can only be the case if the player doesn't have double jump, so the BEQ instruction correctly branches to the no double jump label in this scenario. Next, let's turn our attention to making changes to the individual bits in our power up mask. Let's say we need to process when the player picks up the super armor upgrade, which is stored at bit position 6 in the mask. So in other words, at this point our game needs to flip the bit at position 6 from a 0 to a 1. The code to do this uses an ORA instruction, and it's super straightforward. We first load a bit mask isolating bit 6 into the accumulator, and then execute an ORA instruction against the power up mask. Looking at how the operation is performed across the bits, we see that the ORA instruction has no effect on the bits where we provide a 0, but forces bit 6 to result in a 1, again by the definition of the OR operation. All that's left is to store the result back into the power up bit mask in RAM. With the result stored, the rest of the logic in the game will now read that the player has the super armor upgrade, and if programmed correctly, will react accordingly. But let's say at some point in the game, we need to take a power up away. How can we achieve that? Again, if you understand how to leverage logic operations, the code here is really easy. First, we load an inverted mask into the accumulator, which sets zeros for each of the bits that we want to isolate and ones for all of the rest. In this case, I've set zeros for bits 6 and 2, indicating that I want to remove both the super armor and double jump enhancements simultaneously. On the next line, we perform an AND operation against this inverted mask and the power up mask in memory. For each of the bits that contain a 1, the operation will basically have no effect. If the bit was a 0 before, it will continue to be a 0, and if it was a 1, it will continue to be a 1. Again, I'm just using the definition of AND here. But by placing zeros in bits 6 and 2, the AND operation will always result in a 0, effectively shutting those bits off. It's as simple as that, and we need only store the value back into RAM to complete the task. Ok, we've covered how to test an individual bit in a byte, how to set a given bit to 1, and how to force a bit to 0. Another thing that you can do with bitwise logic operations is to toggle bits in a mask on and off. That's to say, if the bit is off, turn it on, and if it's on, turn it off. Now that you know how to use the 6502's bitwise logic instructions, I'm going to leave this as an exercise for you. Give it a think and see if you can come up with some example code on your own that easily toggles an individual bit in our power up mask. Go ahead and leave your answer down in the comments if you'd like to show off, and I'll love the first few correct answers that I read. See, that wasn't all that bad. No arcane diagrams, infernal contracts, or monsters to be found. I actually think that bitwise operations are super basic, given that you have the right perspective on the data and understand what's going on with the mathematical logic under the hood. So the next time you see some clickbait video about evil or mystical code, you can be all lulls in the comment section. Or you know, just not be baited into watching that video. It's like teacher over the glasses. <laughs> like don't watch <laughs> little little Timmy, don't watch clickbait videos. <laughs> <laughs>